And I think that about covers it. Um, if you are interested in giving a talk, uh, if you're here watching it tonight and you're interested in giving a talk, uh, please feel free to email me, uh, meekins, M-E-E-K-I-N-S, at sc.edu. Or you can uh, join our Discord. Um, the links for both of those are right below the um, the the stream window. Um, you can see it right down there. And uh, or you can type exclamation point Discord uh, in the chat, and it'll give you a link for it there. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, and tonight, as I said, I'll be talking about uh, combustion synthesis and characterization of gallium zinc oxynitride. Uh, my name is Ben Meekins. I'm a research professor, a research assistant professor at the University of South Carolina in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, in, 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 the research, in the research that I do. We do a lot of work with um, photocatalysis and electrocatalysis, especially uh, catalysis in general, uh, especially with an eye to um, energy conversion. So we're not looking to make uh, electrical devices necessarily. We're looking to do things like split water into hydrogen and oxygen, um, convert waste streams into hydrogen gas, um, uh, or, or other higher value products, um, take CO2 and remediate it into something more useful, something that's not a greenhouse gas, um, that kind of work. Um, and so that's, that's sort of where that's a good thing to keep in mind um, as I'm presenting this. So, you, like I said, you, it won't be focused more so on uh, electricity generation. It'll be more focused on uh, generation of power to drive a given reaction. In this case, uh, splitting uh, water into hydrogen and oxygen. So, I'll start off with just a little bit of the motivation. Um, the, the motivation is pretty straightforward. Uh, we need to find something to do with excess solar energy. Um, during the day, it's fine. You can feed it back into the grid. Um, but at night or on days where it's cloudy or, you know, there's a storm that pops up, obviously solar power uh, generation will, will dip. And you, ideally, you have a way to store the excess energy, uh, you know, when you're overproducing what you need. Um, and then that way you can, instead of having to use fossil fuels like uh, coal or natural gas or oil, um, you have a way to, to store your excess for when you actually need it. Um, and so there are several different ways. Batteries are one option, um, but another option is to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And then when the time comes, recombine the hydrogen and oxygen uh, in a fuel cell and generate power that way with the only product being water which you can then store and split again um, and so that's sort of the the goal here is to work on ways to do that um, and so metal oxynitrides have uh, proven pretty pretty useful in this area um, so they actually are used in a wide range of, uh, uh, of uses um, you, you can actually find them in transistors, and of course, as photocatalysts, as I'll be talking about tonight, uh, even in pigments and dielectrics. Um, and a, kind of a famous example of a metal oxynitride is actually um, aluminum oxynitride. It's known as alon, A L O N. Um, it's, it's also known as transparent aluminum. Um, and Star Trek famously had an episode where they talked about transparent aluminum, um, and it was sort of, you know, a futuristic material and nobody really you know at, at that point it was it was fantasy uh, and it turns out that we can actually make transparent aluminum um, it's in the form of aluminum oxynitride um, so it's transparent but it's very strong uh, and has a lot of different uses um, and so that's kind of a well-known example of an oxynitride material um, but there are a number of others uh, as I said, we're going to focus tonight on photocatalysts. Um, photocatalysts are, are useful because they can directly convert sunlight into energy um, or, or useful energy in the form of electrons. Uh, and those electrons can be made to do work uh, if they have enough chemical potential. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, the general strategy for making oxynitrides it was developed by the Doman Research Group out of Japan, uh, Kazunari Doman. Uh, he's he's very well known in the field. He's got decades of work in this um, and has pioneered a lot of it. 
um, the, the general strategy that his group developed and, and uses, you know, with some, with some tweaks to it, depending on what they're trying to do. Uh, but the general strategy is to take two metal oxides that have the precursor materials that they want, you know, the, the metals in particular that they want, mix them together very well, heat them at around 900, uh, 900 degrees Celsius or higher uh, in air. Um, you get a mixed metal oxide, so it's just the two materials combined. And then they flow pure ammonia gas, again, apply a very high temperature, 900 degrees C or higher. Um, and they, they do this ammonolysis for anywhere from one to 110 hours, depending on how much, depending on how readily the nitrogen, uh, the, the ammonia deposits nitrogen into, this, into the lattice and how much nitrogen that they want to try and put in there. Um, and so you can see a, a very nice uh, picture example here. Um, this is actually the same material I'm going to be talking about tonight, uh, gallium zinc oxynitride, made by their method. Um, and you can see you have zinc oxide here, which is white because it only absorbs in the UV. Gallium nitride as well. It's kind of hard to tell here. It's in a shadow, but it is actually also white because it's a wide band gap material. But in between, you can see that this, this combination of the two, when you react them together and replace some of the oxygen with nitrogen, you get this material that is yellow, uh, varying shades, but generally speaking, yellow. And that means that it's absorbing in the visible region, and that's what we want. Um, the UV par uh, portion of this, the light spectrum is only about 5% of it. Um, and so that means that even if you could absorb every single UV photon perfectly, convert every single one of them to electricity, the absolute best that you can do ever is 5%. Uh, on the other hand, the visible region uh, makes up about 45% of the light spectrum. So now you have a much larger window to work with. Um, there's still some limitations. Um, you need uh, energy of at least 1.23 electron volts. That's the thermodynamic potential to split water. In practice, with over potentials to actually drive the reaction, you're looking at more like 1.6 volts. Um, and so you need light that has more energy than that. Um, and so you're looking at around probably 700 or so nanometers. So you, the full 45% uh, of the visible region is not actually available in terms of being able to do useful work, but it still gives you an idea of, of the range that you're looking at. Um, if you can take advantage of at least some of the visible region, your maximum possible efficiency skyrockets. Um, and that's what we're really trying to do. So after these materials are made, then you do various forms of characterization. You can do X-ray diffraction, which gives you some information about the crystallinity of the material. Generally speaking, um, you want your, your photoactive materials to be crystalline. Um, that enhances charge separation um, and allows you to collect more of the charges that you generate with sunlight. Uh, and that's kind of a key thing. There are, there are several steps that have to be achieved before you actually are doing useful work with your um, photoactive material. You have to actually, of course, absorb the, the light efficiently and generate your charge carriers, but then you also need to be able to separate your charge carriers and collect them. Um, it doesn't matter if you absorb 100% of light in a given region. If you can't collect any of the charge carriers that are produced, it does you no good. Um, we also use X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. Um, this technique actually gives you information on the bonding of the atoms uh, and the presence uh, and, and gives you elemental information as well. So you can find out what elements are present, typically within uh, a few tens of nanometers of the surface, uh, but it also lets you know what oxidation state those elements are in. And so that tells you about the bonding of the elements, um, what, you know, if you have, say, an oxide or, uh, you know, even if you have oxygen missing, you can find out what type of nitrogen bonding you have. Um, you can find out if your metal ions, for instance, are in a particular valent state, which gives you information about how the lattice is formed. Um, the, you get a ton of information, um, and XPS is also pretty useful because you can extract information about, um, in some cases, you can pull information about the relative uh, amounts of, of different elements. Um, that's a little bit trickier. You usually need to have a standard, but you can pull out, you can extract at least some information um, comparing among samples, for instance. So if you see if the area under 
a given peak is, is smaller in one sample than it is in the other, then you might reasonably conclude that the amount of that particular formation is, is lower um, with the lower area. And finally, um, you do this, the, the actual photo activity measurements, you, you shine light on your sample with the solar simulator, and you see how much photo current, how much photo voltage you actually generate. Um, again, you can absorb all the light in the world, but if you're not uh, generating enough current from it, there's no point. Um, and you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that your first try at making material will, be, will produce a, a, a highly uh, uh, active material, that's fine. But if you shine light on it and you see no, no activity at all, then you've got a problem. Um, and so th this is kind of the traditional cycle. You, you make the material, you see what you get, you do the, the evaluation on it, the physical characterization on it, um, and then you kind of evaluate whether it's good, bad, somewhere in between, um, and, and you know go back and, and choose again. Um, but the problem is, is that this process can take anywhere from a day to you know a week or so to make a single sample. Um, and so what I wanted to try and find was a way to make these samples, but do it uh, in a quicker fashion, which would allow us to move through several samples um, a lot faster. And so it, it lets us uh, try out a lot of different things in a much shorter time period and uh, evaluate, um, evaluate lots of different samples, see which ones are promising, and then you can go back and refine it and spend more time on trying to sort of perfect those samples. And so the strategy for doing this um, is, is through a method known as combustion synthesis. And it is basically what it sounds like. Um, you are actually setting off a reaction that is somewhat like an explosion. Um, it is not, it, if, you, if you're doing it correctly, it does not blow up um, like, like we think of with traditional explosives. You're not producing that much energy but you do have uh, an, a, a fuel and you do use temperature to set off the reaction and it becomes exothermic and that drives the reaction further. Um, there's a famous video and I tried to find it and I, unfortunately I couldn't. Um, it was first from some, uh, a group that I worked with as a graduate student where they actually showed their reactor and took a video and you can see you can see the edge of the reaction happening. It, it glows up to about 2,000 degrees Celsius, uh, Kelvin, excuse me, and you can actually see the front of the reaction as it travels from the top to the bottom of the reactor. It's very impressive. Um, unfortunately, like I said, I couldn't find it, but uh, you know, I'll keep looking, and if I can, I will uh, post it up on YouTube. Um, but the strategy here is to take uh, two metals of interest, in this case, gallium and zinc, um, I use the nitrate forms here. Um, nitrate is a pretty good oxidant, um, and so that helps drive the reaction. And the fuel here, as well as the nitrogen source, is urea. Um, urea is actually well known when it breaks down uh, thermo uh, thermally. It breaks down and produces a number of reactive nitrogen species. Um, this includes ammonia. Uh, it, it also produces nitrogen, which is not necessarily reactive. Um, although at, the, at high enough temperatures, it can, uh, it can react. Um, it also forms things like burette um, and some other nitrogen-containing species. And so it, it serves as both the fuel and the uh, nitrogen dopant um, for the system. Uh, and the way we prepare everything is, is basically just mix it all in water. Um, I use typically about 10 mils of water. Um, you don't want so much water that it takes a long time to evaporate. Um, because then it, the reaction doesn't proceed as readily. Um, so just enough nitrogen to kind of get everything well mixed. Um, it doesn't necessarily even have to completely dissolve, uh, but if it does, that, that lets you know that everything's extremely well mixed. Um, the biggest thing here is you don't need any ammonia gas flow at all. Um, so when I talk about the ammonia gas, I, I do mean pure ammonia gas, uh, typically at 200 uh, milliliters per minute. Uh, obviously, you know, if you've ever smelled ammonia cleaner, that's only at most 25% uh, ammonia, and it's, that's in the form of ammonium hydroxide. Um, and, and that by itself has an extremely strong smell. Uh, so you can imagine what, one, what pure ammonia smells like, um, and more importantly, what it will do to the person that actually smells it. 
Uh, it's a great way to, to cause significant internal damage if you uh, inhale that. So using my method, um, you don't have to deal with that. In addition, uh, as you can see here, the temperature window is significantly lower. Um, you can, it actually starts at 350 degrees Celsius. Um, and I went up to 800 degrees Celsius to see, uh, to, to sort of uh, check over a wide range of temperatures. Um, but if you'll recall, the, the typical strategy requires at least 900 degrees Celsius, both for an initial oxidation step and then for the ammonolysis step. Um, here, we're doing everything in, in a single step uh, at lower temperatures without ammonia gas flow. Um, so it is both a simpler process and it's also and, and a more economically favorable process. It's also a significantly safer process. Um, this is something that I was able to do in a box furnace. Um, I did put a, a, a vacuum sheath over the top, over the outlet of the box furnace as a precaution. But in general, as long as there's some airflow, uh, you will be safe doing this. And so the goal is to try and form, in this case, gallium zinc oxynitride reproducibly with a known structure using this method. And once we do that, we want to try and correlate the physical properties of the powders with their photoelectrochemical performance. So basically, uh, which, which variation of the gallium zinc oxynitride, for instance, how much nitrogen gives us the best possible photoactive material. And so these are just some uh, sort of example shots. Uh, this is scanning electron micro, uh, micrographs of uh, the powder, or of two of the powders. Um, the ratios you see here are gallium to zinc to urea. Uh, and what you can basically get take from this is you have uh, large chunks of the powder. Um, when it came out of the oven, it looked almost like a foam. Um, and so I generally would crush it with a mortar and pestle to bring it down to a manageable, manageable powder size. But what you see is that we have uh, all these large structures and then a lot of smaller particles as well. And it's not very easy to tell here, but generally these larger structures were made up of smaller, uh, smaller particles that had just kind of fused together. So they weren't, uh, you know, I wasn't making several microns large particles. These were more like aggregates of smaller particles. And uh, the first thing I did was do uh, in, uh, elect elemental uh, dispersion spectroscopy. And so basically what this tells us is which elements are present and with a, within a reasonable uh, degree of, of uncertainty, how much of each element is there. Um, and so it does show us that you know, there is some carbon, of course, but that's, there's carbon detected in pretty much every sample because uh, things like CO2 will adsorb to the surface. Um, lots of oxygen here, but then we also see zinc and gallium both, um, which is very important. That, that's what we're, the main things that we were looking for here. This confirms that both zinc and gallium are there. Um, and we get the, the ratio here. So this was for 1 to 2 to 15. So one part gallium, two parts zinc. And we get a gallium to zinc ratio that's about 1, or 1 to 2.5. And that's pretty close to what, what we expect to see. Again, within the margin of error that, that we allow for EDX uh, spectroscopy, that's pretty much what we expect to see. And so here's what the uh, UV-Vis absorption spectroscopy looks like. Um, UV-Vis absorption tells you where your material absorbs light at what wavelength and how strongly. Um, and so with this information, you can actually extract a band gap of your material. So a band gap would be the minimum amount of energy that's necessary on average to excite an electron into the conduction band, where the conduction band is uh, basically a higher energy um, uh, orbital uh, level. And that's where an electron becomes free to move around which means that it can be collected or that it can do some kind of work for you. So it could carry out a, a chemical reaction. Similarly, the hole that's left behind, the positive charge that's left behind, can also do, for instance, an oxidation reaction. And what we see here is that depending on the starting ratio, whether we do, uh, you know, this one here is all zinc, one to one gallium to zinc, one to two gallium to zinc, and so on, we see that we get actually different band gaps. 
Um, and the trend here is that the zinc rich materials have a smaller band gap on average. So you see like the one to one to 10 here, um, the one to two right here, uh, whereas the gallium rich materials uh, tend to have a large band gap. So for instance, this blue and purple line here. Um, and so if we look at all the different ratios that I did at all the different temperatures that I did, um, in this case, the atmosphere is just air, uh, static air. Um, what we can see is that there's actually a pretty wide window where we get band gaps that are in the visible region. So we consider pretty much anything less than three electron volts to be in the visible region. That's uh, not that's that's a, that's generally the cutoff that that we, you'll see in the literature. Um, and so, regardless of the ratio that we choose, as long as we have some gallium, some zinc, and some urea in a ratio of uh, metals to urea where the, that, that ratio had to be one to five. As long as we maintain that, we get a material that is absorbing in the visible region. Um, we do note that the gallium rich material, especially a three to one to 20, uh, starts to move back to uh, the ultraviolet region a little bit more quickly than the other ones do. Um, but even still, you know, you're still looking at here's you know, 2.6, maybe 2.7. So it's still very much in the visible region. Um, the other big thing here is that this was all done, the reaction time is only 30 minutes. Um, and so this is a very fast reaction, uh, but it gives very reproducible results uh, and, and gets us the material that we you know, want to try and get. Um, yeah, so, the, the, the synthesis window is basically 400 to 700 degrees Celsius um, with slightly extended window for 1 to 1 to 10 and 1 to 3 to 20, so the zinc-rich materials. Um, the, our, our, the most likely reason why that's our window is that below 400 degrees C, um, you're not breaking down the urea quickly enough, and so you don't get a whole lot of reactive nitrogen species produced um, before an oxide forms. And if you go above 700 degrees C, then you get into a region where thermodynamic stability favors the formation of an oxide. In general, metal oxides are going to be your most stable form. Um, and so if you go to a high enough temperature, you, you're more or less driving off the nitrogen in favor of, of oxygen. Um, and so you end up with an oxide there as well. What was interesting was that the reaction atmosphere didn't really have a strong factor. So you can see on the left here is the reaction done in air. On the right is the reaction done in, under nitrogen. Um, and there's not a, a huge difference. The, really, the only maybe the only difference would be the 3 to 1 to 20. Um, in air, it sort of gradually increased as we, as we increased in temperature. Um, under nitrogen, it, it more or less stays flat. There's maybe a, a 0.1. Uh, electron volt gain until you get above 700. <coughs> so, um, some of the lack of effect may be due to the fact that we were using a box furnace. Typically, if you want to control the atmosphere more carefully, um, use a tube furnace because that limits the volume uh, around the sample um, and lets you flow whatever your atmosphere, whatever your atmospheric gas is, um, over the sample and and get it more readily in there. So that may be some of the reason for it. Um, but the fact that we really saw no change at all uh, is still fairly interesting, um, even, even taking that into consideration. The other thing that we did here was X-ray diffraction. Um, so as I mentioned, X-ray diffraction gives you information on the crystallinity of your sample. But what's interesting here is we can actually use X-ray diffraction to um, see if we're starting to form some kind of a mixed material. Um, so as it turns out, zinc oxide and gallium nitride uh, have extremely similar patterns uh, in terms of X-ray uh, diffraction patterns. Um, but gallium nitride's peaks are shifted to slightly higher uh, positions. So it's basically, it's the same uh, crystallographic diagram, just shifted up a little bit. And so what we can actually look for is as we go from pure zinc oxide towards pure gallium nitride, we can look to see if the, if the peaks are shifting or not. If they are, then we're making a mixed material. If they're not, then we're not. And that's actually what we observe. As we go from down here in the red is pure zinc material, pure zinc oxide, 
as we add more and more gallium, we actually do see these peaks shift to higher two theta values, so to, to higher uh, angles, which is uh, just characteristic of the material that you're looking at. But what that means is that we actually are moving from, uh, you know, here being pure zinc oxide, here being a majority zinc oxide, to now equal parts zinc oxide and gallium nitride, and then we move into the majority gallium nitride. Um, and so that's another indication that we are forming the mixed material. We want gallium zinc oxynitride, and that this indicates that we're that we're doing that. Um, yeah. So this this is more or less what I just said. Um, these are all done at the same temperature for the same amount of reaction time. Um, we did notice an impurity phase of zinc gallium oxide. Um, and what that really tells us is that the gallium and the zinc precursors are well mixed. Um, and that as we get to an excess of the gallium, um, we are, we, we do form this sort of secondary phase, which that's not terribly surprising, um, given that the reaction is somewhat uncontrolled, uh, and, and that we're relying on the formation of a reactive nitrogen species sort of in situ. Uh, to, to carry out the, the M analysis. Um, so here we uh, did a, a, a elemental analysis basically uh, to see how much, uh, to see what the atomic composition was compared to what the initial ratio was. So if everything works perfectly um, and we do, you know, if we start out with say equal parts gallium and zinc, we ought to end up with um the you know the same amount of uh, gallium and zinc in the final mixture or the final product um we don't generally get we don't generally end up with exactly what we started with um it's possible that we're losing some uh, of the material to secondary phases um or depending on the temperature of the reaction it is possible to have some of your material volatilize um but in general the, we, what we got in our final composition was reproducible from one sample to the next. Um, the other big thing here is that generally gallium and nitrogen are reacting together, meaning they're forming gallium nitride, as evidenced by the fact that their ratio is pretty close to one for almost all the samples. Um, the, the main exceptions being when we have excess gallium. Um, and similarly, the zinc to oxygen ratio is almost always close to one. Um, which we also expect. We, we should be forming zinc oxide. Um, excess gallium probably is the, leads to the formation of the zinc gallium oxide, um, and so that's fine. The final thing that we did um, was X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. This is the final physical characterization. Um, and what XPS really tells us is, again, what the oxidation state of the, the atoms at the surface are, which if we can be reasonably certain that they are similar to what's in the bulk of the material, um, or in this case, we have a powder that's pretty small anyway, so the, the surface should not be significantly different from the bulk. Um, but what we can look at here is how the atoms are binding and what they're binding to. Um, even, even if you have a material, like so let's say you have um, a gallium three plus oxidation state, Depending on what that three plus gallium is bound to, you will get characteristic uh, peaks uh, or, or binding energies, basically. Um, and the binding energy is is how much energy it takes to break that bond. And every single one of those, every single bond has a characteristic binding energy that that will show up here um, if it's present. And so what we pull from this is that at all temperatures, um, this nitride peak is present. Um, it's most prominent at 550, 600, but it's there even all the way up to 700 degrees Celsius. And that's a big thing. So that means that we're forming a metal nitride of some kind. Um, and based on the uh, gallium peaks that are not shown here, um, the gallium peaks also corresponded to gallium nitride. And so that was a secondary confirmation of it. So this is sort of the most conclusive way to say, yes, we're actually making... Um, gallium zinc oxynitride um, because this confirms what what the atoms or this confirms how the atoms are actually bound so so far with the uv vis spectroscopy with the x-ray diffraction and the elemental analysis we can sort of infer that we've made what we want to make but this more or less confirms it so now that we have this powder 
we need to find a way to uh, actually test it. Um, and specifically, we want to look at the photo uh, physical properties of it um, and see if it actually works well as a photo catalyst. Um, and so because the powder had a range of sizes to it, we had to get a little creative here and basically make our own paint. Um, and the way we do that is, is pretty straightforward. Um, it's a recipe that's been used uh, actually for a fairly long time now, fairly long being you know, maybe 20 years or so. Um, and it's actually based off of a commercial paste um, that you can get for titanium dioxide that a, a number of labs use um, from Solaronics. Um, but the general gist is you take your photoactive material, you mix it with a couple of different weights of cellulose, um, and then you add, <coughs> excuse me, and then you add alpha tapeniol. And what happens is, is the cellulose and the alpha tapeniol uh, mix together, they become like a binder, um, and then you can basically balance the amount of each of these materials that you add to make something that's like a paint. And so it becomes thick enough that you can spread it, um, you know, for instance, with a, with a razor blade using the doctor blading method, or you can actually literally paint it on with a paintbrush if you, if you choose. Um, and then you heat it up, uh, normally only about 200 degrees Celsius is required, and you can burn off um, most of the organics. And so what you're left with is a film of your actual photoactive material. And this is what it looks like. Um, this is just kind of a far out shot, but it's showing that the, the film shown here um, just with a standard picture and here under this the scanning electron microscope, um, you get a, a pretty well-defined film, uh, all things considered. Um, the, the, it's a somewhat porous material or somewhat porous film, um, which is not ideal. Ideally, you would have a very uh, tightly packed film such that you don't have a lot of electrolyte getting through to the electrode underneath. When that happens, you have the opportunity for back reaction of your electrons, which means that you lose some of your um, maximum possible work. Um, but that's more of an optimization thing that will need to be done later on. Um, so for the time being, uh, we you know kind of we kind of ran with this um, and wanted to see what it could do. <coughs> and so we put it in a, a three electrode system. Um, the electrolyte here was 0.1 molar. Uh, sodium sulfate and 0.1 molar uh, sodium sulfite. Uh, sulfite is a uh, whole scavenger. Um, so the reason that we use it is it basically gives us an idea uh, of, of sort of the, the upper limit of what this material will do under, under the given conditions. Um, it, it, it basically allows us to not worry about um, one of the half reactions. And so what we see here is, you know, performance on the whole is not spectacular. Um, it's, it's pretty low, in fact, but there are some clear trends, um, in particular, that the material made at 500 degrees Celsius and the material made at 600 degrees Celsius um, gave the best performance by far. Um, there, there's no, uh, there, there, it's very clear that those two are the best and that 500C is, is the best overall. Um, and you know it is fairly stable. Um, there's some initial drop off, uh, but it, it reaches more or less a steady state by the end of the measurement. Uh, and the the fact that the activity is poor does indicate that there's a ton of recombination going on, um, and that's not a big surprise. If you recall the picture that I showed you, especially the one earlier on, a lot of the particles are very large. Um, the best the the best photo catalyst powders are going to be with particles that are in the range of a few tens of nanometers, uh, whereas a lot of what I had, had had aggregated more or less into larger particles. Um, and what that means is is that electrons have longer have a longer path to travel uh, before they can be collected. And so every grain boundary they have to hop is a chance for recombination. Um, and so the more grain boundaries they have to clear to get to the collecting electrode, um, the less likely it is they're actually going to get there. And that's, that's pretty much reflected here. Um, so that, that's another way, another place that could be optimized significantly um, would be much finer control of the particle size. And finally, um, we actually did hydrogen-oxygen evolution experiments. Um, the way we did these here 
uh, was to basically do half reactions. So with hydrogen, uh, if you use, you can use methanol as a whole scavenger. Um, methanol acts very quickly. And again, it, the, the point of using it is to sort of see the best that your material can do. Um, and so it's pretty clear here, you know, we get up to around 800 micromoles per gram of, um, or 800 micromoles of hydrogen per gram of catalyst. It's not outstanding, but what we do see is a fairly linear trend um, between uh, hours one and four. Um, there is an induction period, which does tend to happen sometimes, um, but we do see steady uh, and clear uh, uh, hydrogen production. And for the oxygen side, um, the way we do this is you add uh, silver nitrate. So silver uh, ions, silver one ions will uh, reduce very readily um, and without much uh, chemical potential needed. And so that takes care of the electrons. And what are left are the holes, to, which can then do um, the oxygen evolution reaction. Um, here we find that the oxygen evolution side of it is much slower. Um, and that's, that's generally going to be true. Um, but it, it is still... Uh, even it, it's not great uh, more or less and so that indicates that the oxygen evolution uh, half reaction here is going to be a major limitation um, for the hydrogen we used a, a well-known literature uh, rome, uh, excuse me rhodium uh, chromium oxide uh, hydrogen catalyst it's basically a core shell uh, where the rhodium is the the hydrogen catalyst and the chromium oxide provides a shell that prevents back reaction so it sort of maximizes the hydrogen uh, evolution um, but of interest was when we added uh, cobalt oxide which is a well-known oxygen evolution catalyst it, it actually didn't make much of a difference and so what that suggests is that the limitation is not so much at least for the oxygen reaction is not uh, at the surface it's not the actual catalytic reaction itself um, it is something with getting the holes to the surface so again that probably goes back to um, the poor transport through the material um, it's also worth noting that without lanthanum oxide uh, photo corrosion did occur so lanthanum oxide prevents the ph of the solution from changing significantly uh, especially when you're doing um, the oxygen evolution half reaction so if you have silver nitrate um, over time it becomes more basic and if it becomes too basic then we started to see uh, photo corrosion uh, finally, we did some uh, two electrode measurements as well. Um, the reason we did these was to see if, in the absence of any bias uh, of, of any reference electrode, of any hole scavenger or electron scavenger, is the material actually photoactive at all? Um, and so it turns out that it is, which was, uh, you know, that's what we were hoping for. Um, the black dotted line here is the the photoactive material in the dark. So there's no photo excitation here at all. The red line here is with the light on. So the solar simulator that we used, um, it's 100 milliwatts per square centimeter, which uh, is equivalent to the average solar irradi uh, radiation um, across the face of the whole earth. Um, obviously, depending on exactly where you are, depending on what the cloud condition is, that kind of thing, um, it, your actual irradiance in a given area will change. Uh, but this is sort of the agreed upon standard um, and the the light source is also filtered such that it matches the uh, sun's actual spectrum uh, as it's filtered through the atmosphere um, pretty closely it's, it's usually within a couple of percent error uh, which again is considered to be acceptable um, but that's the big thing here is even at you know, so at zero volts here there's no potential being applied at all this is literally just your two electrodes connected, shining a light on the working electrode on your photoactive material, and it's generating photocurrent that can be collected. Again, it's not much. It's still only about two uh, microamps per square centimeter, which is very, very low. But it shows that it is at least a photoactive material. Uh, you know, we can make it in 30 minutes, um, and it does work. It needs a lot of optimization work, absolutely, but it's at least it's a method by which we can start to evaluate a number of different materials and then start to refine uh, the ones that are promising. So in conclusion, what we show here is urea-assisted combustion synthesis can produce crystalline oxynitrides with controllable ratios. Um, like I said, even though it was a combustion synthesis, if you start with the same, uh, if you start with the same ratio of the same components, 
and you react you mix them the same way you react them at the same temperature for the same amount of time you're going to get the same thing um, and that's that's important um, what was interesting is that nitrogen can actually be incorporated up to nearly 50 percent so a lot of times uh, when nitrogen is incorporated it's at levels that are more or less doping so that could be something typically in the range of one to five percent and there are uses for that um, but in this case we weren't looking to dope we wanted to actually incorporate the nitrogen um, to reduce the band gap significantly um, and we were able to do so uh, and that's a pretty big thing uh, because that's what the analysis step is typically needed for is to introduce enough nitrogen um, that you're not simply doping the material you're actually changing the chemo the changing the structure of it um, and finally uh, the as synthesized powders were both visible light active and capable of producing both hydrogen and oxygen again for the hydrogen and oxygen it needed help um, you know that in in the form of using methanol to look at the hydrogen reaction and uh, silver nitrate to look at the oxygen reaction but it does tell us that it is capable of doing those half reactions um, and so if we you know if we can improve the material itself add some common co-catalysts that help uh, lower the the potential required for each of the half reactions this material should be able to split water um, without any chemical assistance so in the future, um, we, we still need to get a better handle on the reaction mechanism itself. Um, so we know, we know generally speaking, how the combustion synthesis proceeds, but we, we kind of, it, it's difficult to sort of see into the middle of the reaction. So you, you pretty much know what you put in and what you get out. Um, and so all, all you see is, is like a chemical reaction on paper. You see the, you see the, the reactants, you see the products and that's it. Um, and so understanding how the, me the mechanism actually proceeds is going to be key to uh, finer control over it. Um, and it will also be key to sort of generalizing this method to other oxynitrides and nitrides. Um, you know, this one works well, but that doesn't mean that it's going to work well with other uh, metals. Um, and further, you know, if, you, if for some reason a metal uh, precursor is not available as a nitrate, um, you know, can you substitute that nitrate for something else? Uh, you know, in theory, you should be able to, but in practice, you may not. Um, and finally, we want to try and exercise even more control over the morphology of the photocatalyst. So, you know, in the in the micrographs that I showed you, the particle sizes were pretty large and fairly and, and very polydispersed. Um, and so what we want to try and get is a tighter dispersion of smaller particles. Um, if we can achieve that, then we're gonna that that will um, by that what will follow is that we achieve uh, better collection of the charges that are generated, which means we get higher efficiencies, and that's what we're going for. Um, in addition, what we'd like to try and do is high throughput screening of candidate materials. So the fact that we can make uh, a solution and then um, react that means that there's at least the possibility of putting drops of the solution with different ratios of, you know, say different metals down on a single slide uh, and, you know, carrying out the reaction step, the temperature reaction at, you know, say 500 degrees Celsius um, and producing an, uh, an array basically with different ratios of different materials. Um, and this is not, uh, the, the technique itself is not new. Uh, scanning electrochemical and scanning photoelectrochemical microscopy have a ton of work in the literature, um, and that's where this comes from. Uh, the tricky part here is going to be making, uh, first making the solutions such that none of, the, none of the precursors are crashing out, but also preparing uh, film dots such that when it reacts, uh, you don't have the powder lifting up off the surface. Because um, as I mentioned uh, during the synthesis step, um, with at least with the gallium zinc oxynitride, we get a foam. Uh, and that's because as the uh, urea in particular breaks down, it produces a bunch of gas. And so that gas pushes up through the powder, um, causes, it, causes it to expand basically as it reacts. And uh, if you're trying to make a thin film, that's not a good thing. Uh, but if we can get that figured out, that this will allow us to very quickly, I mean, you, you, can, you can do anywhere from 10 to almost 100 samples at once 
um, and you can control very finely the metal ratios, for instance, um, which will allow you to very quickly optimize your metal ratios. Um, future work as well, uh, we're looking at flame spray pyrolysis um, to try and get smaller particles. Um, the name sort of suggests what it is. You, you literally spray your solution through the middle of a flame uh, or, or a couple of flames aimed at the same spot. Um, and because you've aerosolized it, you necessarily have, you, you, each, each of the droplets functionally acts as a, a reaction chamber um, such that you will end up with smaller particles. Uh, generally speaking, you're going to have a, a tighter dispersion, even though you're spraying this out um, because it's, it's aerosolized, they're going to kind of get to roughly the same size of particles. Um, and it actually will also allow us to better understand the reaction mechanism because the system that we're working with um, has a method to collect your sample at various points in the flame. Um, and so based on where we collect the sample from, we can actually, uh, because, because the reaction happens as the, the precursors travel through the flame, we can actually try and catch the reaction at different, step, at different parts. Um, and see if we can determine how the reaction is actually proceeding. Um, we'd also like to look at the anion droll. So as I mentioned, uh, for this one, we used, the, uh, we used the metal nitrate form of precursor. Um, and so it's important to know if that nitrate is, is a key element of this reaction step. Um, you know, it, it is an oxidizer, and so that may enhance the reaction. Um, and so if it does, that may help us out with, with trying to generalize this reaction where if a metal, for instance, cannot be found or cannot be readily found in a nitrate form, if we can add, say, ammonium nitrate to the solution uh, to make up for that fact and still achieve the same goal of, of making a photoactive, visible, light-absorbing material, then that's fine. Uh, but that kind of all goes back to understanding the reaction mechanism better. And so with that, I need to thank, uh, of course, the University of South Carolina. Um, some of this work was also funded by the South Carolina Space Grant Consortium. Uh, and I had an undergraduate, uh, Austin Kennedy, who actually graduated, uh, I believe, this year. Uh, he actually, or, or this, this past semester. Um, he, uh, yeah, he did a lot of the work with this. Um, he synthesized a number of samples, um, probably several dozen, um, very, very, meticulously um, checking all, all different ratios, different temperatures, um, and even some, uh, he looked at, at the reaction time as well to make sure that that wasn't a strong factor. Uh, and so I need to thank him as well. And with that, uh, I'll be happy to open the floor up to any questions.